thank you so much. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. I echo uh, our previous speakers. Um, this is a great city of the world, great slogan. And uh, you have, in fact, much to teach us. And uh, it is actually quite humbling to be here uh, to say that we can teach you. So we, I, what I'd like to think of is we are on a journey together. And it's a journey of change. And it's a journey of discovery. And uh, we must hang on to that word change. Because you know, nothing is ever going to stay still. So um, as we look at that, what I uh, hypothesize, and I know this is a, a general picture uh, that sort of corresponds with Nat's uh, earlier one, but uh, in our brains, we might be thinking that there's some nice distinct lines between business, uh, civil society, and government. Uh, government are uh, doing social delivery, welfare, housing, um, transport, health, etc. Uh, business is uh, doing some social delivery by jobs and maybe CSR, and civil society is um, delivering some charitable actions. Uh, but my hypothesis to you is uh, that these systems are in fact uh, in transition. And we're seeing a great deal of change. OK. And uh, this is caused, this is being caused by various push-pull factors, which I will go into a bit later on. But it's at the intersections of these transitions that we're seeing innovation. So where business uh, overlaps with government, you're, starting, you're seeing privatization, uh, insurance, special services, specialist services, where um, uh, ch business is overlapping with soci uh, civil society. We're seeing social uh, enterprises, impact philanthropy, social investment. And where civil, this leaves us with one, civil society overlapping with government, we're starting to see payment on outcomes, not just payment for activities. OK, so you get rewarded for success. Uh, and also social enterprise and investment. So it's around these edges that you are seeing the innovations today. And um, I just before I go any further, I just want to state where I've been in this mix. Um, some personal background. I, I have run a, uh, some companies, startup companies, entrepreneur. I sold them on. Uh, I've had a corporate career. Uh, leading to being on the European management board of a very large American multinational. Uh, interestingly enough, we made $5 billion a year, US dollars a year, from data, from information that businesses wanted. Daily information. And so my, um, my insight really is, unless you can... Unless you, unless you measure it, you cannot manage it. That is a classic thing for quality theory. You have to measure before you can manage. And so to do it without data, you're just working blind. So uh, we'll come on to data in a minute. But um, while I was doing the, uh, working at the American Health National, I started up a social enterprise on the side. This was in the early 90s. And in five years, we generated uh, about 350,000 Hong Kong dollars for uh, um, uh, training uh, unemployed people in South Africa. Um, now, since 1999, I've worked mostly pro bono. Um, I was a CEO of a large charity for nine years. And then since 2008, I've been helping four to eight initiatives at any one time. Um, I've made a conscious decision to live on limited means. So I used the wealth I had to fund my life and live on uh, 
limited means, and now I've ring-fenced the amount I want to live on. The rest can go. And if anyone pays me anything, I put it into a company and I use it for projects. So, um, so, some of the co so I've worked across mostly civil society and business. I don't think I could work for government, I'm sorry. <laughs> I would find it very frustrating. And I have great admiration for you who can work for government, but that, that is a, another story. But, uh, um, but some of the comments I'm going to say is, is according to my worldview, OK? And I'm sorry if that may cut across your worldview. And I'm sorry if that causes some uh, discomfort. Uh, so I just ask for your understanding and forgiveness ahead of time. Thank you. Uh, good. <laughs> if I look at push-pull factors that I'm seeing, um, what we have are uh, uh, some social issues. I think we've mentioned it already. It's complexity. We've got an aging population. They're bringing, you know, that causes it in itself um, huge problems with health, care, you know, uh, pensions, um, increasing population and migration. So, so Nat mentioned it earlier, just the complexity now of some of the social issues we have. Um, the government funding, this might not be the same here, but government funding is getting limited. It cannot fund everything. You may hear. Uh, on the charity side, we have donor fatigue. Why aren't these problems solved? I keep giving you money every year. Why are we still got this problem? And uh, so you get donor fatigue. And uh, there is a perceived failure of aid into developing countries. So all this money has been poured into developing countries. And what has it produced? Maybe some very rich uh, people in government, if you see what I mean. Uh, so uh, in business, business values across the world are in sharp focus. So that's another push-pull factor. And the gap between the rich and the poor is increasingly widened. And how can we do that? How can that be? When we've got all the wealth, why should there be any poor? And so we start to get into the ethical problems of, of uh, people. And it, it, comes, you know, it comes down to a lot of factors, but uh, there is a distribution problem, that's for sure. And then we've got the real push thing of technology, things working faster. P expectations of people going up, of instant service. And mass communication. Campaigns can happen really fast. So it is getting a very complex world to work within. And in that world, we have various barriers. Okay, so if I, if I, now this may, you may not have these barriers, okay, but civil society are very poor usually at funding. They spend 50% of the time and money trying to get funds, you know, 20 to 50% of the time of, of their effort goes into just their administration, let alone, so how much actually goes and benefits the people they're meant to be helping? They often campaign against business. Uh, they're heart-led. They're not business-driven. And there's many, many small organizations doing the same thing. Now, in a market economy, in business, you would see those organizations merging, acquiring each other, creating efficiencies of scale. The problem with, well, one of the problems with the civil society is there's no mechanism for mergers and acquisitions to create that economy of scale. So you get all these people with their back offices 
in charities, right? All of, one accountant here, one accountant here, one accountant here. You know, one HR person, you know? So it's all duplicated cost. So how, what legis, well, no, I won't say legislation, sorry. That, that's going too far. But what, what incentive can you give for this sector to become much more efficient? Then there's businesses. So these are barriers. They're good funding engines, but their short-term focus is on profit. And they might turn around and say, well, charity, uh, societal change, that's not our job. Why is that our job? Our job is to make money. And so there's a lack of incentive to them, for them to do anything, anything in societal change. What incentives do they have? Charities are getting incentives because they're getting donors are give, given, to ta well, they're getting uh, gift aid on their, we, we call it gift aid, I forget. I don't know what you call it here, but tax relief on uh, donations. Then, barriers of government. Huge problem in central control versus distributed power, basically. So empowerment of people who can really do things because actually they're, the, they're actually on the streets where the problems are. So how do you give away power but still feel comfortable about it? And that is a, always going to be a problem, I think. Um, now, in, in, if I look at this from a total quality management view, I, as a director of a company, as a, you know, where, where I was, I would perhaps know 4% of the problems. This is the, this is the stats on this. I would know 4% of the problems. A manager of a department would know 25% of the problems. The workers who are actually doing the work would know 100% of the problems. Who are the best ones to cure the problems? The workers. And how do you empower them then to solve the problem? So if you walk down a Japanese car plant line, you will see a red button every few yards or every, every few yards down the line. Anyone on that line can stop the whole factory if they're not happy with the quality. If they detect a problem where they are, they've got the power and they're given the money, the budget, to do things about it. And they don't have to ask their manager. They're empowered to do it. So, for example, I saw a, uh, a, 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 a person who fitted windscreens. Now, to stretch over a car to fit a windscreen, you start to get defects in the seals around. What he had done was actually raise the, raise the line up at that point. So the car was at an angle to him, so all he had to do was stand alongside and go like that and it cured the problems they'd obviously found out. And he had done that. So all I'm saying is, if we really want to solve problems, how can we get power down to you know, the people who are, who are in those communities to do something about it? Then there's political ideology, whatever flavor of government. It's, you know, we'll always run into the politics. Uh, Departmental silos going across gov, never talk to each other, and uh, I've got my budget, he's got his, and of course we want to spend that money. Um, sp speed of change in government, and I really feel for government because they're hearing many, many voices, and they've got to discern which ones to listen to. Very difficult. So here's some barriers. And those barriers conspire to keep the status quo. 
Um, and we need to move to an attitude of uh, how can we make this happen rather than why this won't work. Okay, so it's a much more positive uh, view of engagement. If we think about how to make it happen, I think we've identified four levers today, and I'm glad these all coincide, actually. Um, one is uh, money. Uh, one is the innovations and the ideas. Measurement, the data, and also this move towards social reformers, getting these folk who are going to really make change happen. So those, I'm going to just focus on these now. Um, these aren't in the right order, as Nat said. Okay. I would put, actually, measurement first, because I like to understand things, but that's me. Followed by then the ideas, because then I can base the ideas on evidence. And then I would find the people and then find the money, which in many cases is very small, what's needed. So if I'm going to look at the money first of all. I'm going to go in now into social investment. As money is such a big subject, I will look at just a couple of things. In social investment. Social ventures are, of course, at the heart of social investment. Um, they need to take advantage of the new opportunities to access finance so they can grow and replicate scale and deliver value. And so big society capital at the top in the UK, uh, along with the government, are trying to create social venture intermediaries. Um, and those intermediaries will create project products. Uh, they will design them, launch them, um, and market the products okay, for people to invest into. And so financial institutions and product providers need to uh, dedicate um, uh, human and capital resources on social investment and build the knowledge and expertise that's needed. This is a virgin field at the moment, really. Um, and we've got to think of this as a new class of asset, a new asset class. It is quite different from a financial product. The, um, along with the financial institutions, we have citizens who are controlling huge assets in the form of pensions, saving funds. And there's going to, uh, so how can we put some of that money to use as well? Because this involves then the citizens in social innovation. And if they put their money there, you can bet they're going to be very interested. Now, and then we've got charitable foundations, which one could argue that's the one that's closest to the aims of the market anyway. Okay. Um, and then there's regulations. Now, regulations are set up for the normal financial markets. And certain changes need to happen to establish this asset class. For example, uh, guidance for financial advisors. If you're a wealthy individual and you've got a financial advisor helping you and he is a regulated individual, how does he advise on a social product? When is it okay to say, uh, well, actually, you're going to get a low financial return on this, but a high social return? Will, will the financial advisor be uh, taken to task by the financial regulator because he didn't advise the best financial return? So you've really got to look at some regulation around uh, advisors. There's also tax incentives are going to be very important in this marketplace to establish this asset class. When uh, people invest, wealthy individuals, the first thing they do is put money into their pension funds because that is a very, very tax, well, hopefully 
in the UK. It's very tax efficient in the UK. I'm not sure here. Okay. But the next thing they do is look for tax relief on the next set of investments. And then the last thing they do is look for normal investments. So this set of tax reliefs here that they could get actually makes their investment much more interesting. It, you know, it, it ups their financial return quite dramatically. So what tax incentives need to be established for this asset class? And then there's creation of st standards, definitions, uh, code of conduct, uh, as well as how, what is the recognized measure of social return? How, there must, there's gonna have to be a, a coming together of uh, the industry standard for social return so that products can be compared. Okay, now, so that's, that's a sort of a layout of what's happening in the UK from setting up of intermediaries. If I start to look at the social enterprise market, and this is a busy slide, you won't be able to read this, I'm gonna read out some things from it. I want to explain something about the social enterprise sector before we go further into the investment side. So, uh, Social Enterprise UK published these stats in uh, October uh, 2012, and I'll pick some of them out. There's 68,000 uh, social enterprises in the UK. 9,000 have been started in the last uh, uh, two years. They contribute something like 24 billion pounds to the economy. So, what's that? 260 billion uh, Hong Kong dollars to the UK economy. Um, their turnover has gone, the median turnover has gone from, um, now let me, let me ah, yes, about uh, uh, two million Hong Kong dollars a year in 2009 uh, to around uh, about uh, three million Hong Kong dollars a year. So that's their median turnover, up 30 plus percent. And 58% grew in the last year. So they're actually seeing growth. One in three of these social enterprises are in Britain's most deprived communities. And 82% reinvest their profits back into the community uh, where they are earned. So it's recycling money. Now add to this the charity market in the UK for loans, then, which is 186,000 charities. All of a sudden you've got a, a market of around about a quarter of a million organizations who are looking for social finance. Now most of that will be loan. 70% they estimate would just be loan loans, because uh, this market is quite uh, illiquid. I, I'll go into that in a minute. We, we did some work uh, with uh, uh, financial advisors last year, but one of the things we, we found very helpful was this, there's several mindsets in the industry, okay? Uh, there is a mindset one where people see two wealth pots. I'm a wealthy individual, um, I've got a pot over here that I want to uh, have a financial return. It's for my pension, it's for my children's school fees, it's whatever goal in life you have, that's my financial return pot. Then I've got another pot here then that's spare. Having, having achieved that or projecting that I'm going to achieve what I want to, I've then got all this money over here, well, all this money over here, um, that's spare and I will, I, will, I will do that as philanthropy. I will give that away. Um, there's a crossover mentality where people would say, well, you know, is social investment uh, philanthropy or is it, uh, uh, is it actually investment? So there's, a, uh, there's, a, there's some people who are quite confused, but they don't mind, what, so this is more impact philanthropy. They want, they want a social return, but if they could get their money back, it would be quite nice. But if it doesn't, they're not particularly bothered. We found mindset three, as we move towards the social investment asset class, um, 
we found mindset three to be very useful in explaining. We said, OK, keep your financial return. Don't risk that. OK, keep your financial pot. But then create a social investment pot. And this way, you don't have to trade off. OK? And then also have a philanthropy pot if you want to. So keep three pots in your mind. Now, for some individuals, the financial pot would be very big. The social pot would be, you know, they'll all be different sizes. Some people are very socially minded. They will have a big social investment pot. OK, so uh, we found that this very useful. Um, and what we then discovered as we talked to financial advisors, uh, financial planners, this is, what, this is what will be required to establish the asset class. There's got to be a definition of what social investment is. What is a social investment? Because so much else flows from it, tax reliefs, everything. So that definition has got to be done. Uh, there's a huge amount of education to be done. There's uh, due diligence. We've got to, some work's got to be done on identifying client suitability for these types of investments. So the, uh, the uh, get to know your client questionnaire becomes very important, what questions you start to ask there. Um, there's got to be an ability to track uh, social investments on both financial and a social return. Now, financial return's easy, but how do you actually track on social return with all these different methods around? And so to a financial planner or advisor, that would drive him nuts, him or her nuts. I mean, what, does this do anything or not? You know, Where's the balance sheet? Um, it is diff we, there is a differentiation from ethical investments here. This does not include ethical investment. Ethical investment, and now this is where I will get quite controversial, I think. Ethical investment is actually you're picking stocks, you're picking equity investments or, or bonds or whatever, normal investments that uh, you decide, well, you know, you, you, you only want to invest, you don't want to invest into gambling or pornography or arms or whatever, whatever your ethical screen or filter is. But at the end of the day, you're buying shares in that company. Where does that money go? That money goes to the previous holder of that share. It doesn't actually change the world. But it makes you feel good as an investor. So you haven't actually solved social problems. Social investments are quite different. You're putting money in, they're being used to solve social problems. They're very direct investment. Okay. There's going to be some early adopters in this market, and that's what needs to be focused on. Some people are never going to get it. They're going to be laggards, never want to involve. And product providers have to create familiar products because financial advisors want something they understand. So it's no good creating exotic products that they do not understand. You've got to create a bond, corporate bond, that, you know, this is the return. They've just got to be so familiar with it. And it's got to then plug into their platforms so they can track it. OK? And products have clearly got to identify financial risk their term, how long is this investment going to last, um, a track record, the, um, uh, the risk, you know, the term, the reputation of the provider. Once you've cleared all that, then you can talk about the social impact. People want, advisors want those cleared very much first, before the talking of the social impact. Um, anyway, you can read down the, the, the lines, but they need clear guidelines as well. Financial advisors were very scared of the financial regulator when we talked to them about these products because of mis-selling or not advising properly. 
But above all, we need some early products in this asset class that are successful. If the first ones go in are a failure, then you're never going to get some people interested in this. Okay. And most investments that I've seen here are long-term, you know, typically four to eight years, patient money, uh, illiquid, you can't trade them, you have to wait. How are you going to get out, you know? Uh, it's mostly debt, and the, what we saw was that people are very unclear about risk. It may work, may not. Go with us, trust in us. So, very limited market, really. Um, but what we're seeing is, so there's not that many investable propositions around, and so now what we're seeing in the UK is a number of funds which then seed these new investments, and I think uh, Patrick uh, mentioned those. So you're seeing the Social Integrated Fund, the Impact Investment Fund. So these are, these are investments to try and ramp up um, early stage uh, social ventures so they can become investable. And the other thing, I want to talk on, uh, just, just briefly, on early adopters. We found that uh, investors, would be, some investors would be early adopters. This is an analysis we did on, uh, it's very hard to see, but this is an analysis we did on um, financial advisors. We asked them how socially minded they were. And we found that 30% uh, were very revenue driven. They weren't socially minded at all. They, they will only recommend this investment, this type of investment, when, uh, they, when they see revenue, financial revenue, for the client. 49%, the vast majority, will be client-driven. I will, I will investigate this if the client asks. Okay? But we found 21% would actually say, because they're very socially minded, would actually start promoting this to their clients and talking to them about it. And those are the advisors we've got to launch the, these products down. These are the early adopters. Now, finding them is another matter, but uh, okay. So that's, uh, that's an overview of the social investment market. And as you can see, it is far from mature. It is a long way off becoming an asset class for investors. Long way off. I want to now focus on uh, a particular type of investment, social impact bonds. And this is the example everyone quotes, uh, called the Peterborough example. Uh, a social impact bond, a bond is the wrong word actually, but uh, they call it that. Uh, it funds organizations in Peterborough working to reduce the reoffending rates of short-term, short-sentence male prisoners, uh, young male adults leaving Peterborough prison. The problem is, the problem that we have is that 60% of young male offenders leaving prison, 60% of those under 25, serving 12 months or less, will re-offend and be back in prison within 12 months. 60%. How do we interrupt that cycle? Because at the moment, the government or the, the uh, Ministry of Justice will say, well, I know exactly what my budget will be next year because I know that 60% of people are coming back. So I can, this, my budget is easy. Why should I change it? Okay, so how do we interrupt this cycle? cycle? That year that they leave prison and re-enter uh, re costs in court time, police time, if you put a cost to it, um, costs about half a million Hong Kong dollars. Now, if you can re re reduce those re-offending rates, those savings can be shared. The government can keep half. The people who help re reduce those re-offending rates 
can keep half. So we've got a, um, a bond that's been launched, uh, five million pounds. It's been raised from investors, new money, not government money. And uh, basically, it funds an organization that meets, meets young male offenders in prison, recruits them into this cohort. They're trying to build up to about 3,000 young adults. Um, recruits them in, works with them before they leave prison, meets them on exit. Uh, they already know the problems. You know, is, it, is it educational failure? So you know, it's very hard to get a job. Is it addiction? So can we put them into rehab? So there's a consortia of charities that for, you know, working on these problems to reduce the level of... Now, this started in 2011. Um, we get the first uh, verified results next year. So it's still early days, because it takes a long time to recruit these people. Okay, but if, if the offending rates are reduced by 7% 7, 7 or more, then investors will receive a return. And if they, I think the max, they've capped it at 13% per annum return on investment. So when they get their money back, it will be 13% times five years or whatever. So it's, it's quite good rewards to do this, if you can get it done. The anecdotal evidence is that this is working quite well. But no figures yet, no data. Uh, police in Peterborough have said, things are very quiet around here. <laughs> so it's just anecdotal. So we don't quite know. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening yet, but it's a, it's a great experiment. Um, so this is moving to payments on outcomes, not activities. So instead of getting a grant for a charity, grants a charity, you actually get an investment based on outcomes, and you'll get paid, rewarded when those outcomes are seen. And the risk is not with the government then, the risk is with the investor and the organization. It's an interesting model. Um, and so what we've seen is a lot more being issued now. And these are three examples. There's one for vulnerable children. It costs, it costs. These are 11 to 16 year olds, vulnerable children, 11 to 16 year olds at the edge of care. They're in danger of going into care homes in one county in, uh, in the uh, UK. This provides support to work with the families, work with all the stakeholders around that child, see if they can stop them going into care. Uh, it costs, when they do go into care, it costs up to two million Hong Kong dollars a year to keep them in care. And that can be saved. But there are other stats attached to this which are very important. 25% of all prisoners, this is later on in life, 25% of all prisoners have been in care compared to 2% of the population overall. So they're much more likely to, go, to offend, be in prison. And, and educational attainment by these children is five times worse than the population overall. So what a wasted life. So an intervention very early on does amazing things for these children. And so charities can work, but they're paid on outcome again. And employment the same, putting people, getting back people back to work, and homelessness the same as well. So I won't, I won't go into the details of them, but you can look up social impact bonds, read a few of them. The whole thing is, though, moving to payment by results. Now, you would have noticed I said a few things there about uh, um, families and uh, addiction and other things like that, education. So why am I stressing those? Or maybe you didn't think I stressed them. Um, and I want to start, I just want to go back to evidence. Um, I realize this may not mirror your needs here, your, 
the evidence here. Okay, so you would need to take your evidence. And by the way, I wouldn't just take it from government. Charities, if I speak to the charities here, you've got a huge amount of data. You're working with people every day. You can find out their stories and why they got to where they got to. What caused them? What was the cause effects? What was the causation of their tr being trapped where they are? So there's a huge amount of data you can share amongst yourselves. And if they, you then combine it with government data, I think you could you know, get some correlation going as well. So I would just say don't, think of go you don't just wait for government to get data. Work amongst yourselves and share data. There's some great stories that you might be able to tell. Um, there, are, there were a lot of evidence was taken by a, 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 group, a think tank called the Centre of Social Justice in the UK. A lot of evidence. Uh, 50,000 people were surveyed and uh, thousands of people were interviewed. And uh, there, are, there are various uh, symptoms and I think we went into slightly this, this morning, but they come back to some core stuff that happens. And uh, so um, what, we f what they found uh, was there are five pathways to poverty. If certain things happen, these will lead you on a pathway to poverty. Okay, so if you start to address these, rather than the symptom further down the road of homelessness, for example. Why did that person get home? You have to track it back. If you start to address these at an early enough age, then all of a sudden, you, you're going to save billions, billions late, further down the road and save a lot of social problems. The problem is, it might not be the problem here, but the problem is politicians look for short-term because they, they're waiting for re-election in the UK, for example. This might, this might take 20 to 30 years. So the patient, you know, so anyway, that's a, another matter. Um, so they found five pathways of poverty, family breakdown, educational failure, unemployment, debt, and addiction. In an ideal world, everyone would have the opportunity to live their lives free from poverty, with a good education, a job, free from debt and addictions, and living in a strong, reliable family unit. When one or two of these securities are removed, people can become vulnerable. That might be the loss of a job and steadily growing debts. All too often this can lead to a family split, and the loss of that third security may tip the scales and result in people falling into poverty, leaving them trapped and in desperate need of help. I think that illustrates the point. People get on these pathways to poverty. Most people can survive one or two of these. Uh, you get to two or three, and you get trapped, and you need intervention. So you either go for prevention, or you go for intervention. Uh, so you need, you need both ends, really. And why is this important? Because various consequences have been discovered uh, to do with these causes. So if I run through these, and I'll just let you read them. So, If you're a cohabiting couple with a young child under five, cohabiting couple, you're six times more likely to break up than a married couple with a child under five. Now, question then to government. How much can you, how much can you promote marriage? It's not politically correct, actually, in a secular society. 
So it's an interesting one. So we're seeing fragmentation. So now we see the importance of evidence. What a wasted life, see? What a waste of a life. Hong Kong, you, you will have your own issues, okay? Your own uh, uh, core issues. But if the ideas and the people and the finance were focused on these issues. You can imagine the results in the future. OK. I need to move now on to more evidence, really, uh, and, some, and move into the ideas stage as well. Um, in uh, December this year, I published a, a second survey, a biennial survey, on research that uh, I authored on church and social action. Uh, and that was launched by Nat, uh, Lord Way, and Baroness Vasey, who's the Cabinet Minister of Faith in the, in the UK government. Um, and it caused, uh, we, we got some press, the media, because of connections, though. Patrick is dead right about connections. Um, but she concluded that people who do God do good. Great soundbite. Great soundbite. Good headline, you know. And uh, let's look at... Uh, uh, this is the civil... civil but I'm, I'm going to focus really on the faith sector. Uh, inspired by Lord Way in 2000 and, uh, when was it? That's 2000 and, September 2010. Uh, I've been uh, uh, emailing thousands of churches every month, twice a month normally, in the UK of all denominations to really encourage them into social action. To get out of the walls, into their communities, love their communities. Okay. Um, now, what have we seen in that two years? Now, this is not me doing this, so I just want to stress. I, I think we're seeing a move of God in the UK because lots of churches are doing this regardless of me, and God is just moving through the church, I think, and creating this appetite to uh, go out in, into these hurting communities and minister to people. Um, But what, uh, what we've seen is that uh, volunteer hours in local social action have increased by 36% to 98 million hours. And this is social action church initiatives. This is not Christians working in local charities shops and things like that, which they do do as well, volunteers. So this is, this is just what the churches are doing. So they do 90 million hours of 98 million hours of volunteering They've actually self-funded, and they've increased their funds by 20%. Time of recession, they now put about 342 million pounds into social action. And they've increased the number of social, action, social initiatives they're doing, from an average of 5.7 to 8.2. So we're seeing a, a great move by the church within the communities to help. 
Um, now, the biggest encouragements they're seeing are citizen involvement. They're actually seeing citizens who come along, who don't come to church, but they want to help out in that social action. So they're a great community cohesion. So that's a great encouragement for them. They're seeing good attendance at events they do, uh, church growth. They feel that doing this is actually changing them. That's a big encouragement. They're, they, the encouragement is meeting needs and just the appreciation of people. And remember, this is, this is not government funded. This is church funded. People are giving in both ways, time and money. In fact, very little government, only 24%, there, there is some government grants around, or local government grants, only 24% of churches receive those, and the average is uh, about 120,000 Hong Kong dollars. So, you know, very small, really. The challenges, they, the hindrances they've got are actually volunteers, time, and funding. They want to do a lot more. So, so how do you harness that, that you know, those, this, this is barriers to overcome. So, um, and they're using their own premises. So the cost, the cost to, when I cost this out, um, it's about two, uh, two and a half billion pounds of uh, equivalent of social action, social work. But the other interesting thing is what's appeared are what we call uh, social franchises that churches can take on. And what I've seen is the traditional work of the church, community cohesion, mothers and toddlers and stuff like that, is all happening. There's no franchises for them. Uh, and what we've seen come into play is franchises that a church can take on. So the, these come along and equip the church to do the work. This charity has decided, I'm not going to get any bigger myself. I'm here to equip you and let the church get bigger. OK, so here's some, here's some crisis intervention ones. So this is the immediate action, homelessness, uh, uh, and food banks is an example. And now we have, uh, 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 how many food banks now? Three, 350, something like that. 325. Three, three, two, five food banks. And the estimate is the capacity in the nation is about 700 food banks. Um, but interestingly enough, we're now seeing some franchises occur in those core issues. So some relationship courses, marriage, marriage courses and stuff like that, positive parenting, uh, employment, debt, addiction, educational failure. So uh, employment, there's over 100 job clubs. Uh, debt, there's two, there's two uh, charities there, there's two franchises that a church can take on. Uh, we're seeing about 250 of those centres around the UK. You only need one centre in a town, by the way, because all the churches work together into that centre. So that's 240 towns have debt centres. So we're starting to see these testimonies appear. People paying off debt. Someone who was excluded from school. Okay. Who came to a church to help, and they helped him with their education. And now, they, they take, they've got their A-levels, and they want to work as a teacher. Job club, regaining their confidence. And... Uh, addiction. So we're starting to see some great testimonies come out of this sector. And that is not government granted. That is, so you can start to see there's a, we don't, we should not ignore this sector. Okay, that's what I'm trying to stress. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm going to come to a Rapid close now. Uh, my, 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 when we move on to CSR, what we've seen, I, I would ask you to just take a look at Marks and Spencer. Marks and Spencer, 
in 2007 launched a thing called Plan A, which is CSR. They estimated they would never make any return on it for five years. In 2010, the accountants there, okay, the accountants were very skeptical at the time. The accountants there calculated that the bottom line had improved by 50 million pounds for that year because of CSR activities. Uh, in 2011, they reckon it went up 70 million. So here's an example where CSR is not seen as a cost center. It's actually producing bottom line results. Um, and when I look at social enterprises, I see them grouped into several things, uh, several um, I took a random sample around a long list of social enterprises. There are social enterprises that are working with disabilities. Okay? This is long-term employment for, the, uh, for, for disabled people. So there's a group of social enterprises who do that. There's another group that employ people that find it hard to get jobs, and usually educational failure, stuff like that. How do you get them back into work, MVQ? That, that's probably the biggest set. So they're... they're but the people only stay with them for one year. Because once they've got their MVQ, move on, get a, get a job. Once they've got their vocational qualification, get the next set in. Okay, so it's a bit uh, like, yeah. And then there's actually a group of, a small group, of people who use their disability to earn money. So Shaw Trust, for example, here, uh, use it to use disabled people to test websites for accessibility, and they're paid by companies to do that. Others tour buildings to make sure the disabled access works, and they, it's a consultancy. Uh, you've got payment by results coming up, and then you've got a social enterprise which is quite interesting. This is uh, water; they sell water products, uh, Bello, and they give all their profits away to WaterAid. So it's a CIC, so, okay. My question is, what if you tack this into an existing business? Forget social enterprise for a moment. You've got huge businesses out there. So you've got retail businesses. Could they turn their, one of their shops into an academy, or open a shop, one of their shops, and turn it into an academy for people that are hard to employ, who come through there and learn a retail trade and then go out into the rest of their shops or they go off into other shops. So this is a scheme, uh, there's a scheme in Westminster. It's not run, it's run as a social enterprise, but it's not run by a business. I would have thought, surely a retail business can open another branch to do this. How can we embed? So, you know, and. Our great danger is we're going to drive social enterprise into a very specialized space away from business. Okay? So using social enterprises in the service and supply chain, bringing products into the business to sell. Uh, this, this is a very interesting uh, pickle manufacturer. They use waste, uh, stuff that's going to be wasted. and. Uh, make it into pickles and they use uh, 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 women to do that who are, haven't got jobs. Uh, you, could, you, could, you could add a service extension to an existing business, like a delivery, a delivery business to a franchise. Um, and you could also offer a, a branch of your business to be run by a charity, for example, on special terms. So there's all sorts of ways you can embed social enterprises into an existing business. And I don't, I, I, that really has not been explored very much. Okay. Um, okay. I just want to switch to um, social reformers. I just want to describe one social reformer and then I'll, I'll finish. Uh, Sir Titus Salt, we've heard about uh, Lord Shaftesbury who was in Parliament, there was a social reformer in that space. Sir so Titus Salt, great name, wonderful name. We don't hear that name, Titus, very often. Okay, he lived uh, in the 19th century. Um, he, he was quite a good story, actually. He, 
uh, was influenced by his Methodist faith. Um, he, uh, remember, workers lived in abject poverty at this time. There's no, there's no welfare system or anything. Um, he became a driving force uh, behind his family's wool business in Bradford, northern England. Uh, Bradford was a center of the wool industry, the mills. Um, he invented, uh, he ex innovated actually new products from specialist sources like uh, alpaca and stuff like that and made his money. He drove the value of his business way up because he had specialist walls. He was one of 200 factories in Bradford churning out huge amounts of pollution. Okay. He invented a fire, in his, a heating system in his building, which, which basically produced no pollution. The other factory owners wouldn't take it on. So he was, he was interested in the environment, so he moved the whole lot outside of Bradford, three miles away to Saltaire, built, a, built another factory, built homes for his workers, running water, public baths, lavatory in every home. And, his work, the, and it got them out of the conditions in Bradford. When he died, his family were horrified because when they saw his will, he He'd given all his money away. He was a hugely rich man. And in his lifetime, he gave all his money away. And they were shocked because they, <laughs> they didn't inherit anything. OK? His funeral was attended by 100,000 people. So he was, that's the sort of person. Uh, and when we start to look at these social reformers, um, what we're seeing is they have a great moral fiber. Okay, they have a vision and a passion. They have an ethical framework. They see another world. They're great visionaries. They're, they're, they're entrepreneurs. They have a motivation to make it happen uh, and scale up. And they persist through setbacks. They are so determined to make things happen. He could have just stayed in Bradford. But he said, no, I'm not going to. I'm going to go outside. Um, and he's got a lot of skills. But the other thing is their application of wealth and leaving a social legacy. It's a real lifestyle change. So if you want to start to think about people with wealth in Hong Kong, Actually, you've got to affect the lifestyle. That's very difficult to do. And people, people's aspirations should move from having names on top of buildings to names across people's hearts. That's the legacy they should be leaving. So, what I'm asking you is, are 21st century social reformers in the audience today? Is there a George Cabri here? Is there a Florence Nightingale here? And then how do we develop those social reformers? And how do we, how do we go into the ethics of it, the lifestyle? How do we create innovation incubation groups and learning groups as we, because as we, they all work together. And how do we provide tools to measure and uh, in, uh, pr predict social impact? And th this is what the ICSR is, the, the International Center for Social is proposed to do. And we would love to have some conversations with folk here if you're interested in developing this sort of model. So I, I'm not, this, is, this is just a conclusion slide. Uh, I made all the points, really, and I think I'd, I'll just leave it up here. Um, but the, you can see there are many challenges. And, uh, but I th think this group in the room are very early adopters. And if you put your minds to it, I know you can do it.
I know you can change your world. But persist at it, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.